Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm standing here with the mid laner for Cloud9, Jensen. Jensen, that was a very one-sided affair just then, but I really want to talk about the mid lane matchup you had today. They showed the Lucian early, you picked up the LeBlanc, and before 15 minutes, you were a thousand gold up against him. How did that matchup go, and how did you play that one to get so far ahead? Honestly, I think it's kind of an even matchup, but whereas Lucian is strong early game, but then eventually when LeBlanc gets levels and XP, she can eventually start to like just out-trade him. Um, but um, since I had an early gank, it really like snowballed the matchup in my favor because I was able to hold the minion wave on my side when his flash was down, so he had to play really respectfully. So I think just off of the level 3 gank, like, there's not really much he could have done differently um, besides you know maybe putting the jungler mid lane to try to help out. Because if you don't have flash versus LeBlanc and your lane is, is deep in the enemy side, then you're in a pretty, pretty bad spot. And I think that's kind of just what happened. Like I think it just snowballed a lot off of the early game and then Eventually, LeBlanc kind of wins out in that matchup, but since I had a really good early game, it was just, you know, pretty easy from the get-go. Well, that's great to hear, because you burnt both your flashes to try and get that kill there, and it's great to see you were still able to get a huge advantage out of that. I really want to talk about coming into play-ins this year, because last year's Worlds, you guys didn't go as far as you really wanted to. This time around, it's an even longer journey being seeded into the play-in stage. How has that affected, you know, how you've prepared coming into this tournament, how you've practiced coming into the play-in stage? Honestly, I wouldn't say it has changed our practice much. Um, I think we kind of just have the same approach. Like, we're not playing disrespectfully or anything. Like, we respect our opponents. We don't know too much about them, so they could, you know, potentially be really good as well. So we're kind of just doing the same thing as usual, like practicing a lot and, you know, respecting our opponent, and hopefully we can do well. Well, your next match here today is going to be up against the Direwolves, and now their top laner has come out on Twitter after the group draw and said that he is going to destroy Impact, to which Impact has come out and replied to say that he has no idea who he is. I know you've had very similar words after the group stage draw. How do you feel about this matchup going into the Direwolves next? I mean, uh, I don't really know too much about them, um, so it's kind of like Impact said, like, we don't really know much about them, we don't really know who they are, so... You know, we're just gonna play our style, and I think I think we're we're definitely gonna be the better team. So, I think we should be able to pull out a win here. Well, congratulations on your victory. Best of luck against the Diwolves later on today. We're gonna send it back to you guys. Thank you, Fish, and welcome back to Gambit Gaming versus Lion Gaming. Now, let's just jump right into things by looking at those starting lineups coming in on the blue side. It is Gambit Gaming. Of course, the roster I am very excited to see in the top lane. It is PvP Stay Host, Diamond Prox in the jungle, Kira in the mid lane, blasting as AD Carry, and Edward on support. And facing them over on the red side is Lion Gaming. In the top lane, it is Jeral in the jungle, Audi, mid lane, Sia, AD White Lotus, supported by Genfix, and all coached by Yeti. And of course, when we look across this matchup, fans are not only going to recognize the return of Gambit Gaming, but also a few more faces from the Commonwealth of Independent States. And Diamond Prox and Edward are the big, big returning names. These guys haven't been seen at the World Stage together since Season 2, uh, and it was a pretty explosive one at that when they were together. So hopefully we get to see something similar. Yeah, you're hoping that synergy is still there, mm -hmm. right? Because we did see Diamond Prox in Challenger, but now he's got his uh, EU brethren back with him. But he's also got some other guys there, too. Now he has two members from Albus Knox Luna last year with Kira in the mid lane, and they also have PvP Stehos, who was the jungler, returning to his original role of top lane. Yeah, and of course, this matchup, while it may have looked Gambit favored to analysts initially coming to the tournament, now not looking quite as decisive. They're going to face off against Lion Gaming, who had an incredible performance in the mid-game, potentially could have walked away in their first match up against Team WE. It was a surprisingly close match. Yeah, they just have to clean up their macro a little bit, it feels like. Uh, in the early game, WE was able to grab a lot of objectives, and then once they started winning fights in the mid-game on the side of the Lion, they didn't transition that into their own objectives. They didn't bring enough people for Baron one time. They also could have brute-forced the Baron, but decided to turn off and took a fight they ended up losing so a couple of those small decisions if they make them a little bit better might actually have upset we yeah so i'm looking at these fights because i know both these teams want to have those skirmishes they want to have those bloody brawls so we're going to be looking at that but i also want to look at the mid lane here because say i had an incredible performance against Shie. he ended up coming out really strong in the laning phase with an advantage and then he didn't die until the very end of the game and he's up against kira who we know is good in the 1v1 you go back to all stars mm. from two years ago winning that or at least setting the bar there for the teams or the players, and Kira has those pocket picks. So I'm looking at that in both in-game and in the pregame. 
And it's curious to see, are they going to get their hands on the Syndra again? Are they going to get their hands on the Kogma again? Draft felt like one of these big issues where Lion had so many comfort picks. Yeah, but also now Gambit can kind of look at what was banned against Lion because there was things like Tristana, right? Another thing for White Lotus. If you're banning the Kogma, you do have to consider the power of those picks as well. Well, yeah. we don't have to speculate anymore, gentlemen. We do have the chance now to find out. Sorry to cut you off, Mark Z, because mm. the boys are ready. Captain Flowers, take it away. Thank you very much, Dracos. Welcome to Gambit Gaming versus Lion Gaming. So far, Vettius, we've had two games for Worlds 2017. One very close, one not as close. We did get to see Lion Gaming in that close game up against Team WE. They put up a really strong fight, a lot more so than a lot of people were expecting out of them. And now they get a chance to, to sort of uh, redeem themselves and continue to showcase how strong of a team they are up against Gambit who's now going to be making their debut at the World Championships, the return for them since uh, Season 2 Worlds, where they ended up making Long it time ago. Uh, a fair way, but ended up falling short, and we never did get to see that Gambit versus WE matchup, but we may very well soon. But first, they have to go through Lion, as both teams will be jumping into Champions like fairly soon. And I'm excited to see what Gambit has prepared, because the one thing that both of us agree on is this team loves to roam, mainly yes. on Edward. He turns that 2v2 into a 3 versus 2 on Champions like the Tom Kench, like the Alistair, like the Thresh. So it's fascinating to see if Lion consider him to be a big threat, or if their focus is going to be taking maybe Diamond off some of his comfort picks. All right, let's see how we go into Champion Select now. Lucian and Galio banned away by Gambit. Lion taking Sejuani and Cassiopeia off the table. Alistair, the final ban from Gambit here up against Lion. I want to see specifically how Gambit deals with Lion after seeing what they did in game number one. Is there anything they want to adapt to outside of the strategy they may have had planned? Are they going to specifically play around certain things? And for the third game in a row, Vettius, Zaya is the first pick. Well. It's interesting though, because Tristana is still left open, along with the Rakan, and if Lion decided to go for that, it would not be a bad bottom lane to go for, but they prioritized the Maokai before. They went for very early Braum and Maokai, and it feels like that's just a comfort pick for Lion, having that reliable, tanky front line that Geral can just sit and just soak up a lot of the damage on. So they could look to round things out now with the support. They don't need to lock in that early AD carry, but they run the risk of giving away the Zyra Khan, which, if we go back to game two of the day, is pretty lethal. All right, well, Maokai locked in for Lion. They've got one more pick to make. They hover Wukong forever just to give fans a little bit of a, I don't know, a little bit of a tease, a little bit of a meme to see if they would lock that one in, but they will not take the Braum instead. Now, bear in mind, Jarvan is still left available given that Lion decided to prioritize the Maokai rather than solidifying that kind of strong, engaged, playmaking top laner along with the Gragas. Even after the recent nerfs, teams still find a lot of value in what he brings in the jungle. They think that he is still the most well-rounded. And Gambit, they're going to get themselves a very solid early draft. They have a solid bot lane. They have a well-rounded jungler. Everything looking pretty meta in the favor of Gambit right now. Yep, looks pretty solid for these guys. We'll have to see how Lion responds with their last pick before the second round of bans come through. Granted, they are on the red side, so after those second bans happen, they will get the first pick, and they'll go ahead and solidify their own bottom lane with the Tristana. Now again, Jarvan still left available. Feel like Lion need to consider taking away the Gnar, or maybe even the Camille away from the side of Gambit. But you've also got to bear in mind the fact that this Gragas might be top lane. The thing yes. is, during the finals, Stagios, he actually played the Gragas a fair amount. I believe he played it in two or maybe even three of the games during that final. And the thing about him is he is this big playmaker alongside Edward. And Gragas, in the hands of a top laner, is surprisingly effective at catching you off guard and just making plays happen where you least expect it. And Lion is prepared for Gambit Esports' potential plan here. You can see that even though the Gragas is locked in, they banned the Kane away anyway, thinking, you know, maybe that Gragas is gonna go top. Maybe this is the stay host pick, and we wanna keep the Kane away from Diamond Prox. They'll ban that one out for themselves. Syndra banned out by Gambit. Gonna keep Seiya off of that one. Could have potentially seen what Lion did with that in game number one against Team WE, not dying until the very end of the game. Do not want that happening here up against them. Especially because for both these teams, Vettius, remember that Every group has three teams in it, one of which is one of those pool one teams that everyone is sort of expecting to be dominant. The other two are much more closely matched in the eyes of many fans. So if you're up in a game like this where it's the pool two versus the pool three, 
this game really matters. Oh, because if you're sure. expecting WE to take first in this group, remember that first and second move on, one of these two teams will then get that second place and you need to directly beat the other person competing for it to earn that spot. Yep, and remember that left for today, I do believe that Gamba and WE will still play in game five of the day. Uh, so Lion, this will be their final game of the day, and they're gonna lock themselves in a bit of a carry top lane of themselves. One of the big things I was very excited to see coming into the tournament overall was Jace. I feel like that over in the East, teams like China and Korea, uh, or teams from China and Korea rather, seem to have a much better understanding of how to utilize Jace and how to set him up for success. But we're yet to see it so much in the West. And Lion is going to be a team that demonstrates that while Seiya and White Lotus can be carries, we can also rely on Jiral to be that threat unless this Jace is in fact in the middle lane. We'll have to see how they decide to position him exactly because Gambit has selected Rise and Camille as their two solo laners, meaning that we will be seeing the Gragas there in the jungle. So this is what we were talking about earlier. There was the threat of uh, the playmaking top laner, Camille going in favor of Sejus. And the thing about Rise is another one of those champions that has had a small buff on the most recent patch. The W ratio has had a pretty significant buff going from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. And some people have talked about going for the Abyssal Mask style of build now, rather than the old conventional Rod of Ages, like we see on Cassiopeia as Lion they do in fact round things out with a carry top laner. All right, it's not the carry top laner that we were potentially thinking it was, though. It is going to be Jace in the mid lane with Jax in the top wow. lane. Wow. Okay, okay, okay. Now, this is very fascinating. Lion, a little bit lacking in terms of magic damage. They do have a Maokai. And Jax, Jax is hybrid. He does, yeah, he's hybrid. He's hybrid. I, I agree. But they have no real burst magic damage threat. Right. What they definitely have is a 1 3 1 comp building for themselves, whereas Gambit. They have the option for the 1-3-1, one, 1-4, one, one, but their team fighting is arguably a little bit stronger because of the value Rise can have in team fights, along with the amount of utility that Camille can bring with things like her E and also the zone that she brings from her ultimate. So I give the team fight advantage slightly in favor of Gambit, but what I'm looking at the two differences is Gambit, again, have a lot of engage, like we saw from Cloud9. Rakan, Gragas naturally offer that means to just reliably start fights, whereas from the side of Lion, they're taking more of the defensive approach one again, going for an early Braum using the Jack split push. Maybe you can use them as a flank, but they have no easy way to start a fight. So they need Gambit to be the initiators if they're the ones, if Lion want to be able to challenge for these objectives. And you talked about it, Vettius. Gambit likes to roam. This team, you can see all sorts of surprises coming out, especially from a guy like Edward. Long storied history with this guy going all the way back to Moscow 5, a name from a oh. very long time ago. A lot of fans probably not even familiar with who they are, but for many that have been around since the beginning of League of Legends Esports, they know all about exactly who this guy used to be, the Thresh Prince. As a European fan, it is uh, a pleasure to see the return of some of the Moscow 5 players. Back in the day, they were part of the legacy core, you know, of Fnatic, Moscow 5, CLG, EU, SK. There are a lot of well-known organizations back in the, in the original birth uh, of Europe as a region. And it was Diamond Prox that was one of the big innovators. He was the guy that introduced counter jungling. Right. It was Moscow 5. Yeah, exactly. They were the ones that were three buffing people. And everyone was like, what the hell? They would give their top lane gangplank a blue buff. They would steal the dump. They would do the enemy red and their own red on a Shivana because she doesn't need mana. And it was all kinds of creative and innovative new strategies. And now Diamond Proxy's back. He's a, he's a legacy player. He went from EU, uh, where he didn't have the greatest success, towards the Russian League. And even in the Russian League, he did not have that same level of success either. He has been struggling. Now, for many years, he is back on the international stage. And you have to remember that when you think back to how many pros are still around from 2012, not many. It's exactly not that many. So the guy, he's been trying to keep his skill up. He's been trying to stay relevant to a lot of the young players that come on onto the scene. And when you think of young players, it's very easy to just look at this line lineup and see how well Diamond Rocks, a very old legacy player, will stack up against some of this young individual talent. And I mean, you've got Diamond Prox and Edward, these two guys from away away back with Moscow 5. Last world's appearance, 2012 for that team. Now they're back here, Gambit. 
trying to make an impact in the play-in stage. But you've also got Kira and PvP Stayhost, and these are names for people who watched Albus Knox Luna in Worlds 2016. These guys had a hell of a showing of their own. Oh, they certainly did. Albus Knox Luna getting a win over um, the Rocks Tigers uh, in the group stages and upsetting both CLG and G2 coming off to being able to make it out of the groups and go to the quarterfinals. So they were exciting players to watch. It's now exciting to see how they've grown as early level two from the Lion bottom lane. And White Lotus jumps right into the mix now. Going to be knocked up into the air by Edward, but not before grabbing some good damage onto Blasting. Gambit Esports bottom lane going to be on the back foot for now. Up against this Lion Superstar 80 carry, the guy that we saw not die until the very final team fight in their match up against Team WE. And, and we have talked a lot about Gambit and how uh, it's exciting to see them back on the stage, but we've already seen Lion play once today, and as a team, they definitely impressed. They held their own against WE. They showed their mechanical prowess and their ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against one of the best Chinese team-fighting teams. And now we get to see how they will hold up against Gambit, because they've drafted a bit of a different composition this time around. Again, they do have the 1-3-1, but you still have so much carry potential. But now from even more players, Jural on the jacks going up against the Camille. Feels like they were kind of expecting it, as it is a bit of a counter pick in its ability to just freely farm during the laning phase. And we'll see how well they can set up this one run because it is a much harder strategy to be able to execute, uh, especially when you look at Lion and you feel like their team fighting is just so good. And for Lion Gaming, we mentioned a little bit in Champion Select how when you're not one of the Pool 1 teams in the group, you really want to make sure that you're trying as hard as you absolutely can to beat the other non-Pool 1 team. If these guys lose this game, they'll start day one off at a 0-2 record, which is absolutely not where you want to be, especially considering you're only going to be playing four games. That means the best you can do is break even. Lion really needs to win this game if they want to look strong heading into the second day. And remember, these teams, they only play four games in groups. Right. They're about 50% way through their group, Captain Flowers. Like I say the second day, but I could also say the last day yes. of play in groups, and it would mean the same thing. It's a very short phase, a lot shorter than a lot of these teams are normally used to competing in, and it means that each individual game does have that much more value placed upon its outcome and a lot more consequence if you do drop it. So, so expect these guys to be aware of that. For sure. And we talked a lot about like the big picture in the outside and, and some of the cool players that we have competing. But now we need to focus in on some of the game and how things are playing out. Because in terms of mid lane, nice pressure being put out by Seiya and good support there from Audi as well, enabling his mid laner to have this bit of a pressure advantage. And we haven't seen Jace mid in a while. Uh, I think it actually is one of the good answers to Rise. I think that he can trade pretty effectively. You can itemize early magic resistance, uh, but also you're allowed to run TP in the middle lane so that you can answer if the Rise decides to go off onto a side lane. But speaking of Rise, he's one of those players that has so many creative uses with his ultimate about how you can punish teams if they're in a poor position and you can go for that sneaky rush of a Baron or a Dragon or maybe even set up for that multi-man row down to one of the side lanes. Rise's ultimate is one of those things that you either see a really useless use of it or you see some really cool game-breaking, play-making type of moment out of the thing. And it's just got such this super far up or super far down nature to it. I will be interested to see how that ultimate is utilized as the game goes on. Remember, I also want to point out the fact that you mentioned it in Champion Select Vegas. The magic damage is a bit lacking on the side of Lion, but now they're looking to go in onto Blasting and Edward here in the bottom side. They do manage to find the stun onto Blasting. Flash into the Twisted Advance, still looking to find the play, and they've got the damage thanks to Audi. First blood for Lion. Audi is able to get the first kill, setting up for his superstar bottom lane. White Lotus doesn't get the kill, but it's still a kill over in favor of Lion. They finally get that early game lead, but now Diamond, he's looking to try and answer in the top lane. Jeral and PvP stay hosts. Jeral really wants to shove this in if he can, does not want to allow that lane to freeze where it is, but Diamond Frogs looking to make this punish. Counter-Strike going to be buying Jeral a little bit of extra time. Flash into the Flash with the Body Slam. Diamond Proc still staying on top of Jeral here. But the Ward into the Leap Strike, very useful tool for Jax to be able to jump away to those wards and have an extra escape mechanism. So before we talk about the top lane, we've got to come back to the bot. White Lotus and Gentix. it's not the easiest bottom lane to set up. 
but it's because Genfix is able to land that first hit of the passive. They get that four hit stun. Blasting does not respect Flash early enough, allowing Oddy to get close enough to then land the Twisted Advance, which follows him underneath the turret, but it doesn't matter because he's full health, he has the courage of the Colossus proc, and he has his bottom lane to help dish out the damage in order to get them that kill. And while Diamond tried to answer in the top lane, they just did not have the damage or the collapse in order to get the kill onto Jiral. So Lion are now starting to build an advantage on one side of the map, while Jiral, even though he's at a slight deficit, he's still going even with this Camille. Right, I do want to point out the fact that you do see farm advantages for both PvP Stayhost and Blasting in their respective side lanes, while mid lane, it's Seiya, who's got the edge over Kira's Rise for the time being. Jungle pretty similar between these two. You can't base a lot off of jungle CS counts anyway, since the camps have so much different value between them. One Gromp in a camp, ten Krugs in a camp makes it not exactly add up to be the most even, depending on what they took. Diamond Prox now moving on to his own red buff. Have some extra ganking power there on that Gragas. Explosive cask up. You've also got the Maokai Nature's Grasp ready to go. Both of these are massive tools for making plays happen, Benny. Oh, they certainly are. And with Infernal Drake on the board, you would expect both these teams to try and set up around it. But remember, you have two split pushing top laners. You don't really want to try and force big fights in the early game because there's a really big risk of that top lane 1v1 being swung if either of them are happy to get very quick kills in a few of these early fights. So just keeping them in the top lane, keeping them farming, have the potential for setting up a gank and then maybe transition into a rift owl is the ideal setup uh, in the top side of the map. Blasting and Edward still just keeping things relatively even down here in the bottom side. Lane pretty much stuck there, dead center. Playmaking possibilities available for either side, but Diamond Prox just clearing up the Scuttle Crab in the top part of the river for now. All right, Blade Caller's not gonna find anybody. Now, one of the narratives we initially set up at the start of this was Gambit like to roam and skirmish. Speaking and of skirmishing. Skirmishing right now, Blasting nearly gonna be stunned up by the Winter's Bite, instead finding some good damage back onto White Lotus, making that somewhat even, but still in the losing end of it for now. Right, but going back to that point, um, one of the key facilitators of that roaming playstyle is Edward. And when you play a champion like Rakan, he's really good at roaming. Naturally, yep. he's great at transitioning into the mid lane, into the top lane. He has so many options. What we see from the build path is Edward is actually prioritizing on playing towards the lane. I feel like he's going towards the Ardent Sensor. It's very easy to proc onto, especially a Zaya when you are the Rakan, because the extra long range you get on the E. But He's not gone for early boots. He's not gone for that early kind of mobility playstyle that we see often from his Tom Kench and his Thresh. Now, it's still relatively early in the game, but it does surprise me that his focus has shifted into trying to make sure that Blasting has the best possible laning phase rather than trying to snowball maybe Kira or Stajos uh, in this early game. All right, Cinder Hulk's completed onto both junglers, by the way, so that tankiness is going to be starting to multiply as they buy more health items as the game continues. You can see a little bit of a difference in philosophy between the top laners as well. Trinity Force Rush coming out for Jiral, while PvP Stayhost wanted to go for the Ninja Tabbies first and foremost, reduce some of Jax's damage power against him, and then opt in to his own Trinity Force components. We know both of these champions excel with that item. But of course, with Jiral completing it first, that will be a nice power window for him to potentially utilize. TP is up on both of these top laners. First Drake is Infernal, Vettius, and that can sometimes cause fights that wouldn't otherwise happen if one of these teams really wants to get brave and try to make a play happen on it. Yep. And so far, things nice and close. Uh, not quite as early game dominant as W had in game one, and same for Cloud9 in game two. Laning phase still very even, just with the slight exception of that early kill going in favor of Lion. I think that's fine for both sides. This meta is very much about scaling. But now we do oh! see, Look at the roam from Sejus down into the middle lane. This could that. be a play set up from Gambit. Great steal away on those Raptors from Diamond Proc into the amazing setup mid to potentially take down Seiya, but he gets away. Barely keeping himself alive as Blasting's gonna be stunned up here in the bottom lane. The Glacial Fissure knocking him up in the air, trying to get away with the Feather Storm. The explosive charge, just one hit off. That was awesome, Captain <laughs> Cloud. So much cool stuff just happened. So, we talked about the roaming. We saw it from Sejos just there. He pushed up mid, uh, pushed up top rather, roamed down to mid, and he gets 
a great oh. ultimate onto Set Hound. We might be a... Oh. Oh. Gerald may have just found himself the solo kill on a PvP stage. And that comes back from the flash that Sage just used in the middle lane after the play that Gamma just tried to set up. That's this game just suddenly swung open. Captain That's Lion with a 2-0 lead and an Infernal Drake grab for themselves. You saw Jiral also time the stun and the Counter-Strike specifically to interrupt the hook shot from Stayhost. Awesome job. Oh man, that was, a, that was a great sequence of events. So, in the middle lane, Diamond Prox, I don't know if he was expecting to get that good of an ultimate off, but the moment he did, straight follow-up from Kira with the binding on the W, and also you had... Uh, the E coming from Stadius along with the ulti. It was fortunate the Oddy was there to provide support because then Sayer could flash out and he gets away with his life. Meanwhile, in the bottom lane, White Lotus and Genthix are like, oh, they're having a party up mid. We don't want to be left out, so let's make our own party happen. They force an engagement down in the two versus two. They actually come out ahead against the classic Zyra Khan combo. And they're so close to killing Blasting who saves his ultimate right till the very end to avoid that last bit of burst damage so that he ends up walking away with his life. But because the bottom lane was forced back, it allowed the dragon to be an open window, and Stasius also ended up dying, so there was no TP threat coming out from the top laner. So even though no one died in the initial set of plays, the pressure that was gained enabled Lion to then turn that into a bunch of objectives around the map. Lion now with a nearly 1,000 gold lead for themselves. Two kills up with that Infernal Drake in the pocket. And the next Drake will be yet another Infernal Vettius. So expect the tempo of this game to not get any slower as we move forward here. Closer and closer into the mid game. Stayhost jumping in here onto Jeral. Issuing that Hextech ultimatum to keep him in place as Diamond Prox shows up as well. Finding the cast. Oh, a disastrous ultimate. Here comes Brawl. Actually knocking Jeral away to safety. And now Diamond Prox is going to be the one who's caught out here. Genthix. Sending out the Glacial Fissure as Seiya grabs the kill with a Shock Blast. Not the execution that Gambit needed. And this is Gambit sticking to their style. They're trying to force skirmishes. They're trying to roam around the map. They moved Kira up into the top lane, and they used his ulti to come down mid, but then Lion were ready and waiting. They didn't even have vision in the river. They, they either had a feeling or they were in the right place at the right time, <laughs> but regardless, they turned it around in their favor. Genthix was also able to roam up, and right now they're 3-0 over Gambit. Remember, expectations by many of the fans were that this is the return of Gambit. They're going to be the second seed in this group. And right now, it is Lion after a great performance in game one against WE, but are having another great performance up against this Gambit squad. They beat Gambit to the punch in terms of grabbing the first turret. Blasting and Edward trying to make sure they even that one up by grabbing this one here in the top side. They will have to wait for this next minion wave to do so. But considering Lion already got the bonus for the first one, it's still going to be a game for them. Lion, we're seeing so far, Vettius, this was not just a fluke in game number one. It wasn't just a good showing and the team's actually not that great. They're still doing the same kind of things they were doing in game number one against WE here against game. Yeah, and I feel like they just feel more confident now. It's almost like after their loss to WE, they're now, they have that sense of, we can do this. You know, we can make it out of groups. We can bring it to the best of them. And uh, WE, we heard in the interview from Mystic afterwards saying, that was a hard game. You know, like, they made us work for that win. And right now, Lion are putting the pressure onto Gambit. And again, just look at where the gold is right now for Lion. You've got a 101 Jax in the top lane. You've got a 100 Jace in the mid. And while White Lotus doesn't have any kills, he's well on track to completing his uh, very early static shift too, which is going to give him a pretty significant power spike. And that on center from Edward, still yet to be completed. Yeah, 16 minutes into the game will be a bit slow for the Ardent Sensor. We will definitely need to get that up and running as soon as possible for this team to really have a chance in these fights, especially considering, like we talked about, that Infernal Drake going over to a team that has the likes of a Jax in the top lane, and you've got the Jace and the Tristana. There's a lot of damage there to be multiplied by that bonus. Next one will be coming up here in about two minutes. Uh-oh. Gold lead for Lion. Might turn into a play here in the top side. Maokai ulti coming in, probably going to force the ulti away from Blasting, tries to flash out, Twisted Advance is right there, there's your follow-up with Winner's Bite, and ain't even a thing. White Lotus grabbing himself kill number one. Uh, you know the expression, two birds with one stone? I feel like they should rename it to one bird giant tree, and you end up with a free 300 gold 
and an easy access to the rift powered lion. I don't know and if it flows off the tongue. So I don't know. I think it's kind of smooth, but uh, they're now setting themselves up for taking that tier one in the top lane, or maybe even the tier one in the mid. But lion, they're keeping their tempo in their favor. Lion now moving on to the rift herald. Three men strong. I mean, you can't even really contest this if you're Gambit because you don't have your AD carry nearby. He's just now respawning back in the base. Kira trying to shove up mid lane, at least gain some tempo there. Maybe grab a couple of auto attacks onto the turret. Not even going to bother. Saya rotates himself back over with his blue buff and flashes away. Edward not able to find the setup. So that could very well have been a result of the slight nerfs to the hitbox that uh, Rakan's ultimate had because that was very close and you'd expect that to hit but it was just out of range the knockup would have landed but the taunt in fact missed which yeah. means that Seiya was able to get a very swift flash away and he doesn't end up losing his life so good quick response there from Seiya to uh, to avoid death. Colonel Drake number two just 20 seconds away as Lion sits with a 4-0 lead as well as 2k gold above their opponents teleports available on both top laners. Also available for Seiya, should he need to use that to get into position here. Kira doesn't have a teleport of his own to follow suit, but he does have both summoner spells also up and waiting on himself. Honestly, the only real summoner spell down on the side of Gambit Esports right now is that flash for blasting, but that could be really big in this fight, quite honestly. Same can be said for Seiya's flash over on the side of Lion. Stehos and Jeral into that 1v1 now. Stehos jumping in. Hextech ultimatum going to be issued. Jeral immediately canceling that one out as Diamond Proc shows up to make this fight a little bit less fair. But Audi also waiting in the wings will get his top laner out. But now that's Gragas ultimate and Camille ultimate both gone as the uh, Infernal Drake has just spawned. Lion, they should have no fear of Gambit trying to contest this because with two big ultimates unavailable, it's very unlikely that Gambit would win the fight. Yeah. That's going to be exactly how it goes. They managed to secure Infernal Drake number two for themselves. Going to be that much more damage for Lion. The next Drake is Cloud, so not as much priority on that one as there would be if it were to be Infernal Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you can't whoa, make whoa, whoa, a whoa. fire burn brighter without a bit of oxygen, Captain Flowers. This isn't science class. <laughs> Everybody likes to see the third Infernal Drake, especially when you're ahead like Lion is right now. One and a half thousand gold up, 19 minutes into the game. Baron is going to be on the table here soon. And once it is, we might see some potential crazy plays coming out. We know Gambit is a team that likes to be playmakers. We know they're a team that also likes to make very decisive Baron calls. Oh, for sure. That is an excellent point, uh, Captain Flowers, and something we were talking about coming into this game. Gambit, when they see a Baron, they're like, I think we can take this. And they don't really think that much around the outside, not really about the setup. They just go, I see an objective. At the very least, we can force a fight. And they'll use that to just make plays around the map. And it is, it's a very tense situation if you're a Gambit fan when you watch them playing around that Baron. But when they're this far behind, I don't know if they can really run that risk, especially when you're still fine in terms of scaling. You have a, a Rise, you have a Zaya, and your team fighting overall should still be stronger than that of the Lions composition because Jason Jack's not really known for their team fighting prowess. Right, but we do see Jeral constantly set up in this split push situation, doing exactly what a Jax wants to be doing, creating that one versus one threat consistently. Team add up for him means he's also going to have more split pushing power, and we'll likely see him evolving that into the Titanic Hydra as time goes on. Pretty much the Korean build that has come into popularity with Jax this season. Adi getting himself away from Kira there. Blue buff rise, not really somebody you want to be 1v1ing as a Maokai. We'll throw down the sapling, provide a little bit of extra slowdown time onto Kira there as Seiya pressures on the top lane tier one. Now gonna be looking to go after Kira, knocks him out of his own ultimate, very nicely done. There comes your nature's grab the shield from Kira, not gonna be enough, and Seiya grabs the kill. Kira, he really should have been able to read that play when you have three members of your own team being pushed underneath your tier two tower and Oddy was already making his way up the river. You just have to abandon that tower. Realize the Lion's clear goal is to take that objective down, but instead he stuck around. He used his flash and cleanse and still lost his life. Lion now have full control over the map. There are no outer towers left for them to deal with, and Baron starts to become a big objective that they look to play around. Want to point out, too, that a big item just now purchased. Adi grabbing that Righteous Glory off the back of the gold that they got from the kill on Kira as well as the turret, means the engage power on this champion is going to be there, Vettius. One of the traditional 
exploits that you could use to beat Maokai is stay out of range because Twisted Advance, it's point and click, yes, but the range is short. It is. It's not that short when he runs at you 2,000 miles an hour That's and true. then points and clicks. It's like a tree in a hurricane. I mean, it's going to be difficult <laughs> to dodge, man. Exactly, Vettius. Stayhost now farming up in the bottom lane, trying to get as much gold onto this Camille as he can. He has to stay relevant against that Jax in the one versus one. If Lion manages to get Gerald to the point where he just scares Stayhost away and that's not even competitive, things will be disastrous. Audi, top of the righteous glory, wanting to go in here onto the Gambit squad. Edward utilizing the ultimate, trying to make his way onto Seiya, instead going to be forced to retreat, locked up and beaten down. Kira trying to use the ulti there on the rise, but it's not going to find any success thus far. Lion get themselves one kill and continue to pressure forward. Very quick TP coming in from Gerard, but I don't know if the fight is over just yet. You can see Stagios, he's hanging off onto the side. Lion, they want to keep the push going. Nature's Grasp coming in, more damage coming out from Seiya, who's going to be stunned up. Hextech ultimatum issued, but Stayhost cannot quite find the damage onto his target. He's going to be traded away for Audi. One for one underneath the turret. Edward's still dead, going to be respawning in just a moment. Shock Blast coming out through the acceleration gate to disengage. Gerald wanting to greet out for a couple of chickens here. Gets his dinner and gets out. Bit of disrespect, I feel, being shown from Lion there, because if Stagios was not around, that play could have worked out beautifully, but they were not really respecting the fact that Stagios could just come out from the brush. He still had his TP up. He was ready to go for the counter engage, and that's where things fell apart, because Seiya, he was the one that initially took the tower aggro. He was the one that was forced to retreat almost immediately, and Lion's dive suddenly shifted into, oh, no, we have to protect our mid laner. So the people that were stuck under the tower were then left abandoned. They didn't have the support from their team, allowing Gambit to get this turnaround kill and alleviating the pressure onto this tier two tower. So Gambit, they punished the over eagerness of Lion as they try to push it down mid. Lion continuing to build this lead as time presses forward. Vettius almost 5,000 gold up 24 minutes is an impressive lead to have. And it's going to be up to them to push the tempo of this game even further. Lion is in the driver's seat. They have been for the almost entirety of this game. Yep. And Gambit will need to constantly keep eyes open, looking for any opportunity to punish a mistake from Lion, to utilize those playmaking talents that everyone on this team has to maybe catch someone out, maybe take advantage. Well, Gambit, their primary vision has been set up towards the top half of the map. Their eyes are on this Baron. And given the Lion of Focus, ooh, ulti. Ulti not finding anyone. Audi gonna be disengaging that one nicely. Edward nearly taking down the explosive charge, almost sealing his fate. They heal to keep him alive. Maokai Ultimate coming in, looking to chase these guys down. Lion does Jax. not want to run in any further because they are four versus five, but Jeral is pushing towards that base. Oh! Nice shot! Seiya dialed that one in to find the kill onto Edward. Beautifully placed. That's going to make the fight go the way of Lion, despite the four versus five nature of things. And as Stayhost takes his position back bottom to stop Jeral, the rest of Lion moves up to the top side to claim the tier. And look at how very quickly they've translated their vision to. They were originally setting up for that dragon, but after a team fight in mid that goes in their favor, they've moved all their vision up through the top side of the jungle, and now their eyes are on the Baron. With Diamond Proc still alive, it could be a risky play to make, but he's getting zoned away by White Lotus. Lion just keep finding these successful fights. They're utilizing this split push in Gerald. And I'm just so impressed with how regularly they're able to turn these fights in their favor, even though they only have four members. Demonstrating once again the plain or the, the raw talent potential that is on this lineup uh, for Lion. Gerald now two levels up over PvP Stayhost. He's got himself a 2,000 gold advantage to go with it. He's got a red buff. This Jax is absolutely disgusting at this point in time. Steos Camille stands really no chance in the one versus one situation. You can see they're bringing Kira down now to try to help him maybe bait the Jacks into a deceptive 1v2. It will not happen. Jeral says, wait, if this guy's not completely running away from me, something has to be wrong. So he backs himself away. And, uh, you know, we got to go back to the draft a little bit, uh, Flowers, because I was concerned for Lion. I was like, okay. they're running a 1-3-1. One one. They have no real way to engage. Gambit seemed to have this great team fight scaling comp with a bunch of playmakers, which very much fits to their style. But Lion, after they found that great early gank in the bottom lane, once they got White Lotus and Genthix ahead, 
they could just leave them. And they were like, oh, now we can't win 2v2 bot anymore. Even though we have the Zyra Khan combo, it just cannot compete with the slight advantage that this Lion bot lane was able to accrue. And that meant the Audi was just keeping Saya alive. All these little skirmishes that Stehos and Diamond Prox tried to force in mid were always turned around in the favor of Lion. Either through a great TP from Jeral, Audi showing up at just the right time. Lion have just reacted extremely well to all of the plays the Gambit have attempted to make. And they've been able to shut them down consistently throughout the year of the game that has now translated into this very healthy 7,500 gold. Lion's been a lot of fun to watch this game. They were a lot of fun to watch in game number one as well. This is a team that clearly did their homework coming into Worlds 2017. They knew what they had to do coming into this game to win. And like you were talking about, worried a little bit about this team's engage potential if they can start things off on their own terms. Audi has been doing a great job at finding angles and finding ways to get on top of targets, utilize the nature's grasp effectively. A lot of people have made jokes, especially when Maokai was first reworked about how, you know, you can win the game, and by the time you get in queue for the next one, Maokai's ult will actually have reached his target. But he's been doing a fantastic job at setting those up early and getting them into position by the time the rest of the team is there in order to make those plays happen, like what you saw in top lane when they caught Kira out. Yeah, completely agree. And now you might be wondering, like, why aren't Lion pressuring the Baron more? They have the 1-3-1 one, one comp. They actually don't need to. Their pressure comes from just playing these side lanes and forcing Gambit to split up because Seiya has a level advantage, an item advantage, every kind of advantage over Kira and Jerol. We've seen multiple times now how much stronger he is than Steho. So they just have to keep playing this 1-3-1. They just have to push out top, push out bot, and wait for Gambit to try and group and force a fight or they will just eventually win these side lanes. But Lion, the thing that's stopping them is their their deep vision. They're not following up the pressure with wards in the enemy jungle. So that's forcing both Seiya and Jerol to play a little bit more defensively because they don't really know where the enemy is. That singular shock blast nearly killed half of Edward's health bar. And <laughs> then the to the skies afterwards will nearly finish him off as Diamond Prox now gonna be caught out taking down the enemy jungler. Could be the green light they need for Baron. And the flash is too little, too late. White Lotus grabs the kill. And that means Gambit now finds themselves in seriously dire straits. Jeral continuing to push up underneath the enemy turret there in the bottom lane as well. Baron going to be taken down rather rapidly. Already to 50% HP by White Lotus, Genthix, and Audi together as a trio. Seiya is not even required. Gambit has no way to resist this. And Baron will go over to Lion Gaming 30 minutes in. And Diamond Prox, he wanted to prove himself on the international stage. He tries to go top lane to help his mid and support out, but then he ends up being the one that gets caught out. He's the one that loses his life, and he gives the Baron over to Lion, who are now just running it through the base of Gambit. Where is the team? Kira is bottom, Stehos is dealing with Jeral. Meanwhile, the door is just being smashed open, and Lion Gaming will take the inhibitor not even 30 seconds after grabbing the Baron for themselves. What a momentum play from these guys. Now you've got Jeral on the bottom side. We can rotate down here if we need to, they're saying. We can go into the top side. We can do 1-4, we can do 5-0. It doesn't matter. This team is in an awesome spot to seal this game. Lion, after their game one performance versus WE, they were close to victory. A lot of their fights looked good, but again, they didn't really translate that into a lot of objectives. Coming into game two, they seem like a much more even team with Gambit, but they find all these great early game leads and they're finding much more control over the map. Sure, their vision could still do with a little bit of work. They're not properly using it with the pressure that they gain, but the one thing that you can say is that they are always ready for whatever their opposition tries to do and they react so effectively to quickly shut it down. And speaking of readiness and reactions, it's a criticism of the current Gambit Esports squad that they sometimes appear disorganized because the entire team has so many different playmakers and you have so many different heads of this Hydra essentially wanting to find a different opportunity. And that's sort of what we saw after the Baron was grabbed by the side of Lion. You saw Kira going bottom saying, oh, we're gonna collapse on Jeral, we're gonna get this guy, while the rest of the team is saying, no, 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 we should probably, you know, save our base. Well, now it's, it's a team attempt work out, and now Jeral is going to be collapsed on by five members. They will find the kill onto him, but they traded away for the tier three turret as well as inhibitor number two. That's still a good trade for Lion. Yeah, they're more than happy to give away their top laner. Jeral, he still has a healthy KDA. It's not yeah. the end of the world for him to die. Sure, he will lose the Baron, but now you can just group as a five man, sit in the bottom lane, have Jerol maybe even push mid to just empower or just drag the minions rather into the base, but 
Lion have everything that they could possibly want right now. And even though Gambit are able to get themselves one small thing back, they have not been able to keep up with Lion, who just seem to have answers to every kind of uh, play they try to make. Gambit trying to push up the mid lane now, realizing they've got 15 seconds before Jeral is back alive. However, Jeral has TP when he is back alive, so you cannot put yourself in too precarious of a spot here if you are Gambit. You can see a couple of wards off there in the jungle on the side of Lion, so if that collapse is given to them as an opportunity, they could always take that. But now they're going to be sending everybody into that bottom lane. There's one inhibitor left standing, and that is where Lion's attention will go. That is what they're looking for. White Lotus, he is primed and ready to go. Three and a half items completed with the QSS to boot. Let's see how Lion make this fight happen. Gambit gonna be the ones making it happen instead. Edward looking to jump in with a nice initiation, but he's gonna be killed immediately. Genthix backing himself away. White Lotus on a rampage as Stehos retreats. Geral into the back lines, blasting, barely gonna be kept alive. Seo wants to change that. Geral jumping in as well, and that is your clean ace for Lion Gaming. The gold lead is too big. Lion are too strong. They bite down hard onto Gambit Gaming, and they're looking to get their first win at the World Championship of 2017. Lion makes their statement here against Gambit. They look good in game number one. They look great here in game number three, 14 to two. That's how you win a game of League of Legends. Beautiful game coming out from Lion. We talked a lot about how strong they looked in game one, and they translated that so easily into their second game of the day. They took a commanding early lead against Gambit, and they not once let it go. That was just a phenomenal showing from every one player on Lion together. Everybody was doing their job. The final score for Genthix that game, 0-0 and 12 on the Braum. The actual support dream score. No kill secures, no deaths, all supports, doing all that work for the team. Both carries, by the way, I made a point of saying in game number one, look at Seiya, look at White Lotus, neither one of them died, neither one of them died ever until that final team fight where WE won the game. And in this game where they won, Seiya and White Lotus, both no deaths. These carries are very good at staying alive and preventing a mispositioning that could otherwise get them in a bad spot. I think you could have just ended it with, these carries are very good. Like, these guys <laughs> have been playing phenomenally. They did a great job against Team WE, and they did another great job here. But you also have to look at Gambit. Because yes. at the very start of this, what you said was, these games really matter. And when you think about these two teams, Gambit and Lion, you would imagine, based on expectations, that they're going to be the ones fighting for that second seed to try and make it out of groups. And now that Lion have come out the gate swinging and gotten that first advantage, the pressure's on Gambit to get some kind of surprise upset against Team WE. Well, now that Lion have found their first win, and to break down on exactly how that win happened, we're going to send things over to the analysts. Thank you, Captain Flowers. Just have to say, once again, mechanical plays coming in from Lion Gaming are absolutely amazing. But even more impressive is the fact that this wasn't even in the early game like we saw in the match versus WE. They were smashing it pretty much from the start. Yeah, and this is a lot closer to their domestic style that they are kind of more known for. They pick really lane dominant stuff and they try their hardest to destroy you as quickly as they can. This was the team that going into MSI had like a 4,000 gold lead on average at 15 minutes into the game. Yeah, and the fact that they were, you know, once they got it to MSI, it was Gigabyte Marines in the same group, mm -hmm. which makes you really excited for what's going to be here in the future for Lion, because I'm becoming a fan of them after these last two games. If they make it out of this group second, they could be playing a number one seed like Hong Kong Attitude potentially, right? They actually stand a pretty good chance if they keep this form up to actually make it to the group stage, depending on draws. And Looking really good. And one player I want to highlight in the early game was Adi coming in in the jungle, actually. On that Maokai, we had heard that he might be struggling to make an impact in the tank meta. He might not be able to find kind of the same footing he has in the past. Did find the footing on Lee Sin, and now in this game on the Maokai as well. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting draft just because there's so many flex picks going on here. You have the Maokai taken right away, uh, and you think, okay, that's cool. Then the Jace comes in, and you say, oh, that's probably going to go top Maokai jungle. That makes sense. And in the last pick, Jax, <laughs> you're like, okay, we're going all over the place now. Yeah, Lion actually kind of changed their draft up to have those dominant lanes, so they were able to have a good mid matchup and a good uh, top lane matchup for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and able to play almost a stylistically identical composition, just with a little bit more to leverage in the early game. 
Yeah, I think that's that's the big thing is both teams kind of have this more one through one. We want to skirmish. Someone gets big and we split them off and hopefully they carry the game. But like you said, Lion having the counter pick advantage on red side and that flex pick advantage, finally being able to get the, the lane steps that are going to let them snowball this game. Also, they had an outplay advantage. Yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's be clear. The Jacks coming in from Gerrall was absolutely insane. We can look at some of his early plays coming in because realistically, this advantage was made so much bigger by this man's individual Yeah, great decision to step into Ed, uh, Diamond there, excuse me, get that stun off so it's a little bit harder to change CC. He's able to flash later and get his jump back up, able to survive. And then when he has the chance to go advantage after a PvP Sos had blown his flash in the mid lane, he's able to get his own kills back in his favor. Yeah, capitalizing off of mistakes there from Gambit Esports, but absolutely running away with the game off of that, saying he has no fear. That, that Camille just messed that up, and he's able to draw so much pressure, so much attention. Yeah, it, you know, Jax in the mid lane, you think that's a pretty easy kill usually, but as people come in, they're able to get into support. He times his abilities correctly, making sure he stays safe. I swear that his Jax E has more range than my Jax E. That is just <laughs> insane. Every <laughs> time. Typical complaint. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks so clean coming in from him, and this is just so interesting too, because it's such a different style. Game one was so slow. They're showing us this now. And do you think this is the face of line we're just going to see from now on? Is this incredibly dominant style? Yeah, I really wish this is what we actually had seen out of game one versus WE because you saw with that lead, they're able to cleanly snowball basically no problems in that gold graph there. And it's the kind of thing where they had their red side game already versus WE. I would have loved to have seen a similar strategy then go as aggressive as you play in your own region and bring it to China. Don't play scared. And it felt like they played potentially a little bit more of the game of, of their opponent where they, they took a, a more late game focus with that Kogma. Yeah, I think what they ended up doing against WE, late game focus for them, but also I feel like they kind of put their top laner draw on a tank and made it so they had some insurance because they were going to yeah. play Lee Sin jungle. If you play a tank jungle and you give yourself a split pusher like they did, then you can open it up and have diversification and have your, uh, you know, your kind of standard tanks into composition and not just a mono tank comp. And the one thing we're still looking for them is more BM because these guys are known oh for it. They had a little, spamming, a little. Spamming. Marcy, you love this they BM so much. They had a little bit of it, but they, I need to see more. <laughs> just because yeah. uh, when you watch their finals in their region, like they would be down gold, just still spamming away. I mean, it's it's what they are. They're this aggressive, lane dominant, very confident team. It did bite them a little bit when yeah. they got caught out. You know, <laughs> uh, but this game, there was a little bit of Tristana laughing. I do think that they brought some confidence with them. And to go up against a team like WE that people are favoring to make it out of the group and you know saying that they could even go far potentially afterwards I feel like they have a bit of swagger and that's what I like seeing from this team I like it too but to round this out we've been praising line a lot I want to look a little bit at Gambit just one final statement what needs to change for Gambit if they want to find wins because it's already a rough start it just felt uh, like a lot of small individual things went wrong a number of engages out of Edward came up a little bit short the nerfs to Rakan maybe being an influence there uh, they had a good chain CC combo on Sia in the mid lane just missing a little bit of damage to finish him off maybe they could have optimized that a little better there were a lot of small mistakes that kind of led to that deficit yeah I think the way I kind of encapsulate this game for Gambit Esports is impatience. I felt like they had a good kind of early skirmish bottom lane. Then everybody's playing aggressive and Audi got some really kind of obvious, really easy ganks off on Maokai where he's like, oh, they're playing really aggressive. I can just walk up W in here and start snowballing. He had really high kill participation in the mm -hmm. first five kills of the game. He was involved in four of them. And so they were allowing this Maokai to just walk up instead of playing it slowly, getting vision control, and then going from there. Definitely was a good look for them overall on the side of line to punish those mistakes coming from Gambit, see what they can do, what they can do to improve the team as we look towards their games later in the day. But we're going to step away. When we return, we've got teams looking to back up their Twitter banter in Dire Wolves versus Cloud9. Meet us back here after the break. Personally, I want to see how it unfolds. Who is this guy? To blasting and Edward here at the bottom side. They do manage to find the stun onto blasting. Flash into the twisted advance. Still looking to find the play, and they've got the damage thanks to Audi. Maokai ulti coming in. Probably gonna force the ulti away from blasting. Tries to flash out. Twisted advance is right there. There's your follow up from Winner's Bite, and ain't even a thing. Edward utilizing the ultimate, trying to make his way onto Seiya. Instead, gonna be forced to retreat. Locked up and beaten down. Jeral is pushing towards that base. Oh! Nice shot! White Lotus on a rampage as Stehos retreats. Jeral into the back lines, blasting, barely gonna be kept alive. Seiya wants to change that. Jeral jumping in as well, and that is your clean ace. 14 to two. That's how you win a game of League of Legends.